Welcome back to chapter 9. In this example, we're going to go a little bit quicker through the process um, because this is a very similar, simple problem like the previous two. This is the first time, though, where we are caring that the bar has a weight all its own. And that's something that's going to show up in all of our problems moving forward. Um, real bars or beams or boards, they all have real mass, which means the force of gravity acts on them. And in the lecture video, we discussed the fact that the force of gravity acts from the center of that object. It's called the center of mass. And that's something we'll be having to remember to include in our problems moving forward. All right, so we have our real picture already. It's right here in the slides and in this example. I just saved it from the slides. We also know that we care about the forces, so we'll draw a force diagram, a free body diagram. And the arrows are all nice and big for us already. The force from support 1 we will call F1. The force from support 2 we will call F2. And the weight of the bar, Fg, is mass times little g. And it's a 10 kilogram bar, so 10 times 9.8 is 98 newtons. And so that free body diagram has all the information about forces in it already. We now move on to the torque diagram. Now, if we have not yet been training ourselves to draw this step by step, please be aware that it's really important we know why this matters differently than the real picture. So the step one is we draw the beam. We will be seeing horizontal, or we will be seeing angled beams, but this is a horizontal beam, so we just draw a straight line as best we can. Step two is extremely, extremely important. We're going to choose our axis. Since we picked the right side support in the previous example, I'm going to pick the left side support here. So again, just like I mentioned in the previous example, choosing an axis, there may be times when there are multiple equally good choices. That is true here. Choosing it at support 2 or choosing it at support 1 are both equally valid. And so it may be worth trying on your own the other axis and making sure that you understand how we get to the same final answers. Step 3 is drawing in the forces onto our torque diagram where they're located, but remember it's only the forces that are not at our axis. So we aren't going to care about drawing F1 because it's acting right at the axis. But a certain distance away we have the force of gravity which we've calculated to be 98 newtons. And even further along we have the force from support 2 which we'll call F2. Step 4 is to draw the distances. And these are the distances relative to the axis. We cannot be choosing just the 0.9 and the 1.5 because they're in our picture. We need to be aware that these distances that we're putting into our torque diagram are based on the location of the axis. In this um, first 98 Newton force, the 1.5 meters is in our picture. That 98 Newtons is 1.5 meters from either end. And then for the force from support 2, the full distance to get from support 2 to support 1 is 1 1.5 plus 0.9, or 2.4 meters. All right, so step five in our torque diagram is the directions, clockwise and counterclockwise. This matters because torque cares what direction this rotation would be if that were the only force acting around this axis. This 98 Newton force down relative to the axis that we've chosen would be causing rotation in the clockwise direction if we were to continue this circle around and around that axis. And the force 2 from the support, if that were suddenly the only force acting, it would cause rotation up and around that same axis, counterclockwise in this case. So when we write out our torque clockwise equals torque counterclockwise idea, we have, again, one of each. That will not continue to be the case, but in these early, early problems, it is. So we take the force, 98 newtons, 
times the distance for that force, the 1.5 meters. And then we have for the other side, we have the unknown force, F2, times the known dif distance, 2.4 meters, that that force is acting, 2.4 meters. Again, the setup is the crucial part of these problems. The math tends to be just dividing by one thing or adding things together and then dividing. And so we get that the force from support number two, so the torque itself is 147 newton meters. We are asked for that. And then we divide by the 2.4 meters and so our end result for the force is 61.25 newtons is the support force number two. It's fine to round that to 61 or to 61.2 or to 61.3, um, but I'll leave that just because it's um, going to be the other 0.75 that matters later on. And it is time for the later on. This was one of our two equations available, one of our two requirements for static friction, the other is that the forces have to add up to zero. F net equals zero. This is the other requirement for a static equilibrium problem. And so we look at our force diagram. F1 points up, F2 does as well, so we'll add it. And gravity points down, so minus 98, all that equals zero. And so to get the second force that we haven't yet gotten, which is technically the force from support one on the bar, we will add 98 to both sides and subtract F2, which in this case, we're going to plug it in, 61.25, and we get 36.75 newtons, or 37 newtons, or 37, 36.7, or 36.8, any of those are good. And that's for the support number one on the left side. So these two are our two forces acting on the bar. The gravity force is also acting. We solved the 98 newtons. And it says to find all of the torques. We've drawn in the torques and each of the two torques based on the axis that I chose would be 147 newton meters. We will see plenty more examples they will continue to get more complex as we move forward, but we will use the exact same process every time, which is why we're trying to practice this process now on simpler problems so that we feel confident applying it to tougher problems. See you in those next examples.